Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I'm very humbled to be able to present here in front of many heroes of mine. And um, uh, if you have any question or criticism, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me or talk to me. Uh, I think um, uh, in my philosophy, I'm doing the research work not uh, because I want to be the first one to doing them or be the best one. I want to be them to be most helpful and useful for humankind. Uh, today, I will talk about uh, some of the work we have been <coughs> conducted at the uh, University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, my research was now mostly focused on medical application. Uh, before I start, I'd like to give you some background how I get uh, to this point. Um, by training, uh, my PhD thesis is in microwave, and uh, my PhD advisor, Professor Rutledge, uh, introduced me to electro, micro electromechanical system, in short, MEMS, uh, introduced me to use uh, MEMS techniques for uh, microwave application. Uh, MEMS, in short, uh, is using solid state device technology, fabrication technology, to make very small mechanical parts. And today, actually, we use quite a lot in our life. Uh, for example, every one of you uh, in a car, you have one or more uh, MEMS device that's in uh, airbag sensor. And the Wii controller, your iPhone, your iPod, your iPad, they all have a MEMS device, a accelerometer or a gyroscope. And the final dream of uh, people work on MEMS is how do we shrink the robot uh, into micro size so they can enter our body to repair our body. <laughs> In my past work, uh, I focus on using uh, MEMS device for millimeter wave application. Uh, for example, we uh, use uh, MEMS devices to build uh, actuator that can move uh, micro uh, structures or use them for microwave switches, microwave capacitor, or reconfigurable antenna. Because uh, they are so small, we can fit uh, quite a lot of them on a single integrated circuit to increase the power efficiency and uh, functionality. And of course, we have some fun. So uh, in my lab, we build a micro cowboy stadium for Lilliputian. Uh, this is, we actually built this uh, uh, cowboy stadium before the cowboy stadium was built. Uh, this is a scale one to one million. And in the middle of the field is a cowboy, uh, you can see where a cowboy friend, um, cowboy uh, Hamlet um, actually is uh, sitting on a thermal actuator. Uh, just to give you an idea of the size, uh, 100 micron is about the diameter of your human hair. Uh, we also build something for UT Arlington. This is a Maverick uh, Spirit. Uh, these are carved on silicon fighting uh, with uh, fire end. Fire end is a big problem in Dallas. And uh, we like to use this technology to address our medical application. So in my lab, uh, we are focusing on that uh, uh, technology for medical application. I have two motivations uh, to do this. Number one is uh, the healthcare cost is uh, keep increasing. The red curve here shows for the past 15 years how the cost per person per year has go up uh, statably. Uh, but I couldn't help but wonder if you look at your computer price, they keep going down, particularly like a hard drive, computer hard drive costs. 15 years ago, it was $1,000 per gigabyte, but today is 10 cents per gigabyte. So I believe that engineering providing mass production uh, capability and some sort of network management uh, capability can help to bring the health care uh, costs down. And the second motivation I have is that uh, I'm a professor. I have to worry about my students' future. And this is a survey according to IEEE uh, in 2007. Um, this shows the potential um, R&D job in the future. And biomedical engineering still remain to be number one. So as I train uh, the young scientists and researcher, I have to think about their future. So, in 2002, when I joined UT Arlington, uh, it provided me a wonderful environment for me to switch from mostly military and telecom application for MEM system 
to now uh, in medical application. So in my lab, we combine multiple uh, technologies to address uh, medical problem. For example, we use uh, nanotechnology, in particular nanowire or nanoparticle, to functionalize uh, the surface to achieve uh, sensing uh, uh, capability. And we use uh, MEMS technology to build miniature probe or sensor that can go into the body, uh, uh, particularly into small spaces like brain. Uh, we use uh, optics uh, for in vivo sensing or in vivo imaging, and we put a sensor on flexible substrate uh, in order to be biocompatible for the tissue. Most of the sensor we build uh, utilize uh, wireless communication in order to transduce the signal from inside the body to outside world. And of course, uh, all the medical implant has to be very small, so we design our own integrated circuit in order to pack as much as functionality into a single chip. At the same time, uh, we have to also study biology. Uh, in my lab, uh, we also study uh, how cancer cell migrate on a microfluidic uh, uh, devices. And most of our device has to go through the animal model to be validated with their functionality and performance. And today, I will mention um, three major uh, technology platform we implement for medical application. The first one is uh, wireless uh, neural devices. Uh, we are developing uh, automatic pain recognition and inhibition system. This is for chronic pain uh, management, but it can also be used for many neural disorders such as Parkinson's disease. We also expand the application into intraoperative uh, monitoring for spine surgery. These are the, my collaborator's name. Uh, I work with a medical doctor uh, at UT Arlington uh, Medical College of Georgia and uh, Scottish Rite Hospital for Children. And particularly, Dr. Penn and I have been working on the pain management uh, issue for five years. The chronic pain is an uh, issue globally, and just uh, to be in the United States, uh, many of us has chronic pain, and uh, billions of dollars has been spent on the medical expenses. In the last resort, when uh, Advil, Tylenol, uh, aspirin, they don't work, uh, the doctor will recommend uh, to use a morphine pump. Uh, the implantable morphine pump inside the body, uh, as you can understand, they run into risk of addiction and overdose, and also is not controllable uh, by the patient. Uh, neural stimulating, however, offer an uh, attractive option, especially uh, today, the spinal cord stimulation has been used uh, clinically. Uh, the neural stimulator is uh, a device that delivers a very small amount of current into neuron, uh, kind of like a moder uh, modify or block the pain signal, so it never reaches the brain, so you don't feel the pain. Um, so the patient very often uh, feel a sensation, like a tingling sensation, instead of the pain. And for the past 20 years, uh, it has been uh, proven clinically effective and safe with very little side effect. However, today, even though uh, clinically uh, it reports more than 50 to 80 percent pain reduction can be achieved, the system is really not optimized. Why do we need to optimize the pain? Uh, pain is an indication of some illness and danger. For example, you put your hands on a hot stove. You want to be able to feel pain, otherwise you don't know uh, when you should retrieve your hands. So we should really uh, optimize the signal, uh, optimize the system in order to distinguish uh, the chronic pain and acute pain. And current system is open uh, loop, so the patient has to constantly manually control, adjust the dose themselves. So we are trying to uh, address a system that we can have a feedback mechanism to optimize the pain. But the question is, what is pain anyway? Pain is a subjective feeling. You go to the doctor, they ask you, give me a number, one to 10, how do you feel? Many people say five or eight. What does that mean? The doctor or the patient themselves really don't have any means to optimize the uh, stimulation dose. So our hypothesis is, can we qualify, uh, quantify 
pen signal in order to use the signal in a feedback loop to optimize the simulation like many of us do in the control theory in electrical engineering. So we propose a system that implements multiple neural sensors inside the body that can be in the spinal cord or in the brain. They communicate by wireless. The device acquires neuron signal transmits to a portable electronics like your iPhone or uh, smartphone. Uh, in the smartphone or iPhone, you have a mechanism that can categorize, recognize, classify, and also find the best dose for the patient. Then send wireless signal to the neural stimulator that's also implanted inside the body to deliver the currents. And so this way, our mechanism forms a closed loop between the body and the machine, continuously optimize the dose so the patient will constantly feeling uh, uh, less pain. In my lab, we have developed a wireless module, which is about the size of a dime, uh, that can be implanted. But today, because we don't have FDA approval, we only use the device for animal model. This is the experimental result. The green, the blue curve here is indicating uh, the signal uh, neuron uh, 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 fired. Uh, these are from spinal core uh, WDR neuron. And each one of these is uh, action potential that indicate a pen signal. By counting the frequency of this pen signal, then we can summarize with using this uh, histogram to show that the pen level, the higher the bar, the more pen the animal experience. The green curve here is a neural stimulator implant signal in the brain. We use, uh, we put an implant in the deep brain area called PAG. And each one of these uh, uh, green square is actually uh, 80 uh, electrical pulses. And by uh, applying a pen stimuli, such as a pinch, in the leg of the animal, and we will be able to coordinate the pen signal with uh, the received uh, signal. Uh, when there's a no neural stimulator, neural, neural stimulation, you can see that the pen signal exists. However, whenever we start the neural stimulation, the pen signal now disappears. We also coordinate the animal's behavior with the data to validate that indeed the signal we receive is pen signal. Uh, we have done a statistical uh, data analysis with uh, 45 uh, animal model, and we found by applying three different pen stimuli, brush is indicated as the no pen, and pressure and pinch indicates a higher pen. And we found that the blue bar and the green bar is before and after we turn on our, uh, our system. The red bar is when we turn on our system for more than 10 minutes, and we found that uh, our pen inhibition a mechanism can reduce the pain by uh, 25 to 30 percent. This uh, system can actually be used for many different neural disorder. Uh, this is a list of um, approved, FDA approved, or uh, research under study uh, neural stimulation uh, condition. Um, the, the black font indicate FDA approved, the red is under research. And in our lab particularly, we are working on uh, using the feedback mechanism to reduce tremor for Parkinson's disease. This is a collaboration with uh, Dr. Cole Giller. We uh, uh, use this for inhibit pain in brain or peripheral nerve system. We also use this to monitor uh, the spinal uh, core uh, injury um, uh, surgery. Uh, also, we use uh, this technique to continuously manage uh, gastroparesis and incontinence. Um, neurons communicate uh, not just by electrical signal, they also communicate by chemical ways. Uh, they are called a neurotransmitter, such as glutamate, dopamine, serotonin, and GABA. These chemicals, they are related to uh, neural disorders such as depression and addiction. And um, what we are trying to do is not just coordinate the electrical signal, but also coordinate the chemical signal to understand uh, the uh, issue with all this neural disorder. So what we do is uh, we implement um, the neurotransmitter uh, electrode 
uh, by functionalized uh, with enzyme on our MEMS electro, with a one single electro, we can have five or seven or uh, 11 electro uh, simultaneously uh, sense a different uh, neural transmitter and coordinate them with neural, uh, neuronal uh, action potential. Uh, we hope that we can find uh, the uh, fundamental uh, issues uh, between the neuron and neural transmitter. This is showing the probe we built for animal experiments. They have all different sizes. The small one is for rodent, and the long one is for human or monkey. We can also build them on flexible substrate or rigid substrate. Flexible substrate allows the brain tissue to move with our electrodes so they can be used for long-term implant. This uh, curve shows the electrical signal coordinated with uh, glutamate uh, concentration in the brain. The second uh, project I want to talk about is a batteryless uh, implant. Uh, many implants today uh, use a battery. The battery has a limited lifetime. So after the battery is exhausted, you have to go back to the doctor, have a surgery, replace the device. So we are trying to address this issue by implementing batteryless solution so that implant uh, either is a sensor or a stimulator that can harvest the energy from outside the body and use the energy for sensing or treatment. Uh, this collaboration uh, involves uh, University of Mississippi Medical Center, UT Southwestern, uh, University of Auckland and New Zealand, and also UT Arlington. Uh, in particular, Dr. Ten and I are working on gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, GERD. GERD is a disease when the stomach contact rush into the esophagus, and many, us, many of us has this, uh, this problem, uh, we call the heartburn. Uh, often you go home, you take some anti-acid, and you're fine. But some people, they have chronic uh, GERD problem. They, have, they run into the risk to develop uh, esophageal cancer. Esophageal cancer is the fast growing cancer in the developed country um, and very often is uh, not uh, curable. So our um, uh, problem is um, how do we detect uh, reflux? Uh, there are two types of reflux, acid reflux and non-acid reflux. Non-acid reflux is silent uh, because you don't feel the heartburn so the patient very often don't feel the pain. Uh, GER has been indicated as the prime risk factor for esophageal cancer. Uh, so screening and take uh, prevention uh, surgery is necessary. However, there are more than 19 million uh, people in the United States might have GER, so the doctor cannot screen one by one using conventional approach. The conventional approach is uh, insert from the nose a wire into the patient's esophagus. At the tip, there's a uh, Electro that can sense the reflux. And then the doctor taped the wire on the face and sent the patient home, said for the next 48 hours or 96 hours, you drink, eat, sleep, and work regularly. And imagine that that's almost impossible. You got a wire coming out on your nose. <laughs> and not to mention that very often the doctor will put four wires in case that you accidentally yank them out. So um, it's very uncomfortable, so the patient alter their activity, then the result is not accurate anymore. So what we are thinking that, uh, hey, today we have wireless device that you can watch movie on your wireless device. Why can we make this wireless? So we we'll implement a wireless device, and also it's a batteryless. Uh, the device can be attached in the esophagus. Externally, the patient will wear an electronic device. They beam the inductive energy into the esophagus. And the implant will harvest the energy, use the energy to operate the sensor and send out the signal and log into the device. And 48 hours or 96 hours later, you take a memory stick to the doctor and doctor has all the data. This is uh, showing uh, how we conduct the experiment. This is in the pig's esophagus. And we put an endoscope camera in there so we know when the acid reflux really happened. Uh, the color is a little bit brown because uh, the animal just has a Diet Coke. <laughs> and now the liquid is uh, leaving the esophagus. And so by image, uh, by the video, we have an accurate assessment of when the acid reflux happened. But outside the body, what we see is this electronic signal. As soon as the uh, module is put near the body, it pick up the signal inside the body. 
This is a baseline of 7.2 kilohertz. And now uh, we fed the animal some water, and you can see the signal now drip up to 9.43 kilohertz. That indicate it's a non-acid reflux. And as soon as the water left the body, then uh, left the esophagus, then it will go back to the baseline. Now we fed the animal some orange juice, which has a pH level of three, then the signal now go to 9.8. So by observing this signal, we can see all this uh, episode in the body, uh, in the animal. Uh, we, this is a statistical result. Every one of these bars shows uh, acid reflux or non-acid reflux. We also coordinate that with a pH sensor. And we fed the animal with all different kind of liquid. <clears throat> and we found out that our device can accurately sense the episode. For example, in the vinegar case, uh, our device sends three episodes, but the conventional device only sends one episode. Our device also works for alkaline solutions such as biojuice, so you can also pick up the episode. Uh, particularly, we also implement uh, the peer sensor and impedance sensor together, so not only the wireless communication can provide one signal transduction, but also it can provide multiple sensor transduction. We also use this technology to treat uh, gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is the vagus nerve got damaged and the stomach just stopped working. Uh, the patient very often sends uh, nausea or vomiting. Conventional treatment is to put a neural stimulator inside the body. Uh, the neurotransmitter in my hand is about this size and it's quite big because majority of the space is used for battery. So the uh, doctor needs uh, one to four hours to put this device into the patient. <clears throat> and the patient needs to go back every three to six years to replace the battery. What we do is that by get rid of the battery, we can actually make the device much smaller. They are very small, they are so small now, we can actually use endoscope to push the device into the stomach and uh, uh, staple or clip the device on the stomach to provide that stimulation. That way the patient will not need a surgery anymore. And we have done some animal experiments. This is the control uh, data of EGG signal that indicate the motility of the stomach. By <clears throat> stimulate the stomach, we also make our device with a different uh, dose, different setting, and we can see that the stomach motility has been modulated. We also use the similar technology for incontinence uh, management. Uh, urinary incontinence is, uh, major, is a major issue in the United States. Uh, today, the patient can use uh, sacral nerve stimulation and control the bladder function. However, it still is an open loop system, so the patient needs to push the button themselves. Sometimes when the sensory nerve is damaged, the patient simply don't know when to go to the restroom. So what we do is we also implement a closed loop system. The patient will be wearing a belt. In the belt, there's a, a transducer. The device uh, transmits the energy into the bladder, and the sensor on the bladder will send the volume information back to the uh, box. We use MEMS uh, capacitor strain sensor to implement the sensor, and is in uh, in, encapsulated in a biocompatible uh, polymer that can be taped on the bladder. And this indicates the uh, volume information sent outside. <clears throat> as soon as the volume reaches 380 milliliter, it indicates that, well, maybe you should go to the restroom now, and it will continue sending the information to the box until the patient decides now is a good time to go to the restroom. You will push a button and send neural stimulator signal to the bladder uh, sacral nerve and the bladder sprinkler and void the bladder. These are the second uh, application uh, my group is working on. The third uh, project we are working on is a microfluidic device for migration of cancer cell. This is for acid of cancer metastasis. Particularly, we are working on prostate cancer, and these are my collaborator at Arlington Cancer Center, UT Arlington, UT Southwestern, Urology Department. Uh, UNT Health Science Center, and UT Dallas. Um, prostate cancer is the leading, uh, most common cancer in men, and is the leading death of cancer in men. Uh, prostate cancer, however, is a slow-growing cancer. 
um, it usually doesn't kill the patient right away. What uh, happened uh, to the patient, um, what happened to the fatality is uh, metathesis, especially bone metathesis. That's when the prostate cancer migrate from prostate to bone. Um, there's, um, unfortunately, there's uh, no existing uh, therapeutic agent for uh, bone metathesis. And also, in the near future, one out of the six men will develop uh, prostate cancer in our lifetime. So the real um, taunting question for us is that um, after the surgery, how do we prevent the patient to develop uh, metathesis? Um, so what, uh, what we are trying to address is uh, can we have an asset to screen or track in order to prevent metathesis? Uh, this is a mechanism for metathesis. Uh, when cancer cells become invasive, they, go th they break through the membrane, they crawl on the cellular matrix until they reach the vessel, and then they travel inside our body until they found a perfect place, and they go through the membrane and grow a second tumor. Very often, that's uh, bone. Um, our hypothesis is there must be some sort of chemical factor around the bone to attract the prostate cancer want to go over there to grow a second tumor. So what we did is uh, we used a microfluid device to uh, mimic the vessel. We built a, a PDMS device on culture dish. It consists of uh, two well. One well is for cell seeding. One well is for patient serum or growth factor. And we uh, implement a microchannel between them, and we functionalize the devices to make them uh, mimic uh, our human vessel. And we observe how the cell migrate from the left side to the right side. If the cancer cell really like the chemical, they probably want to go to the right side and divide and grow on the right side. We also make the device a uh, array uh, configuration. That way, we can use them for high throughput screening, potentially in the future in the clinic. This is a typical result showing uh, the functionality. This is a control experiment that is uh, the blood from a, a several healthy uh, male. And this is a patient that has already has metastasized uh, prostate cancer. And the bright spot showing the cancer cell migration. As you can see that for the prostate cancer uh, patient, uh, the cell migrates uh, like crazy. And we have done a double blind experiment. This is showing three patients' data. These three patients have metastasized prostate cancer. These two are donor, and this is uh, fe fe uh, fetal bovine serum as a control. If you zoom in into the red color, that is a day four data. And we found that for every one of these uh, patients, we can observe the prostate cancer cell in the channel, indicate that they're on the migration when uh, there's no cell migrates in the control. Uh, our device also provides a real-time observation for cancer cell migration, so we can actually watch them, how the cancer cell migrate. They don't actually go straight line. They go back and forth like an oscillator. And we can also use this device to observe individual cancer cells, such as this one. Uh, this one is actually like mutants uh, become a starfish shape that try to squeeze into tiny gap. So we indicate that this cancer cell might have a very uh, high uh, invasiveness. So uh, to conclude my talk, uh, today I present a pain management system using wireless technology a battery-less technology used for GER sensor and uh, for gastroparesis management. And we also are study the cancer metathesis using microfluid devices. I would like to give uh, my sincere uh, appreciation to my funding agent, especially Texas Instruments, Intel, Texas Health Resource, Mr. Anunziato, uh, Texas ARP program, NSF, NIH, and CI and also military support. And of course, uh, this work cannot be done without uh, the staff's help at uh, Scottish Rite Hospital for Children, University of Mississippi Medical Center, all the doctors and nurses, as well as at the UT Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, the devices are made at uh, UT Arlington NanoFab facility, and uh, uh, these are my group member. Uh, we have 31 students, and uh, without their work, uh, the research now cannot be done. And thank you very much.
sometimes uh, I think uh, engineering uh, uh, discipline is that uh, we uh, present a problem and we solve the problem and there's no question asked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but actually, uh, a lot of these devices, they are still under development. We want to make it smaller, more efficient, and of course, uh, used for human, we always have to pass the FDA approval. Uh, another tool. JC, that, that's really beautiful work. W what is the effect of implanting these devices? I mean, the adverse effect that the body goes through to have this, these small devices stuck in these, these places over, over a long time? Uh, thank you. Um, that's a question we are trying to address uh, during the animal experiment. And unfortunately, most of the, the longest experiment we have conducted is only uh, three weeks. Uh, so we could not uh, quite answer that question yet. Uh, most of the devices we uh, implant uh, is either in the stomach, on the bladder, or on the scalp of the brain. Uh, they are not uh, in direct contact in long time between tissues. So I don't know when the immune system will be act triggered uh, to reject all these devices. Uh, that is the question to remain to be uh, answered in the future. Um, my question may be related with the previous one. Uh, the body rejects these implants if it does not like the material. Um, and I think that you are using traditional materials like gold wires or titanium probes. Yes. And the question is, in which we can help probably, are you using um, the, the carbon nanotubes or the materials which are very, very chemically intact for the body? Diamond um, the wires, nanowires? Um, uh, currently, we are using uh, titanium, um, which is uh, widely used in the medical industry, and carbon nanotube, carbon wire, and also we are also trying um, silicon nanowire. Uh, is remain to be uh, answered. Uh, we don't quite know uh, if they will work um, in terms of functionality, performance, as well as the long-term uh, efficacy. We have shown that carbon nanotubes and published are very, very uh, good for neurons. So maybe we can start together on that one. Yes, uh, that's always welcome. and. Uh, uh, actually, this is kind of funny because I just accept a new student who will be working on carbon nanotube uh, for the uh, neurotransmitter sensor. And I think that will prov not only provide a new functionality, but also very high sensitivity for the sensor. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank right. our speaker again. Thank you very much. <laughs>